let me see. Let me remind you of something that we've been talking about the last few weeks. This is all one meal. It takes place the same time. It's a very long meal because we've been studying this for what? Like five, six weeks now and it just keeps going on and on and on. So truly it must have been a big ordeal because as I mentioned to you all last week, remember that these, this was not an easy thing for somebody to do. There was no Kmart, no Walmart, no, uh, no giant eagles of which these guys could go to buy all these groceries for 13 guys. Certainly no extra alcohol, certainly no state store to buy this at. So these guys were probably running this Pharisee pretty well dry of his food and his alcohol stores. But, and here they were getting into this argument, Jesus with the, the scribes and the Pharisees that were sitting here, gathered here around the table. So as I mentioned, we're still at this very same supper. And Jesus, if you remember a little bit about last week, he had just finished a criticism through a parable of the Pharisees. You remember what that parable was? Remember how he highlighted through the parable the, that a secular, non-religious, immoral, dishonest manager was better at using his financial resources, is wiser at using his financial resources than were the Pharisees. Now, if you remember, here are just a little bit about what was taking place. Here's where the Pharisees were getting their money. See, they had these offering plates, and those offering plates were filled with money because everybody in their community was required to put 10%, a tithe of all their income, their first fruits, into those offering plates, and there were a bunch of people left in the community. So how do you think these guys got wealthy? Well, they took from here. They bought nice big houses. They bought their Maseratis. Tell you it's in the Bible somewhere. I'll find it. Whatever. But they were well to do, these guys, okay? Not all of the Pharisees, but at least in this community, the people that Jesus was struggling with were more concerned about the wealth, their prestige, their house, than they were about the people they were called to minister to. And so this is one of Jesus' lessons about money. And I know very skeptically, a lot of people, one of the reasons why they say they don't come to church is because you're always talking about money. Well, I am going to talk about money today, but I'm going to talk about it in a way that you don't normally hear. I'm not going to talk about it and say, put your money in here. How many of you have ever heard me say that? Never done that, have I? I've never highlighted these offering plates until today, and I'm only showing you these offering plates for a reason. They're here, but I'm using them as illustration that this is not what we're about. In fact, I'll tell you what. Go to Disney. We just learned that Mia really likes Mickey Mouse, right? Take her to Disney World, and I bet you go up to Disney World, and they're going to say, oh, if, if you don't want to pay anything, you don't have to. Just come on in. It's free. You think they're going to say that at Disney? Don't think so. But that's what you get here in church. You come to worship on Sunday. Nobody's asking you for money here. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome at the table. You get fed. It's all for free. If you like, you're welcome to give. But see, in Jesus' day, there was an obligation that was placed upon you by the Pharisees. You don't walk into the doors until you put your offering in the offering plate first. And it better be a tithe, and it better be a lot, and it better be good. Because the Pharisees were watching. So this is the obligation that was placed upon people. The Pharisees, however, take a little bit of umbrage at Jesus' story about the, uh, the, uh, about the secular, non-religious, dishonest person who was wiser using money than they were. And so by getting upset about this, they proved to Jesus that they basically are idolaters of money. Again, they love their money more than they do Jesus. So here I'm going to read the lesson for today, which is found in, uh, oh my goodness, I am really, can't find my glasses, can't read it. There we go. So uh, our lesson for today is from the book of Luke, chapter 16. And here's the lesson. So this is following up. So Jesus follows up this criticism of the Pharisees with another lesson that's directed at the Pharisees, and it goes something like this. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple, fine linen, and lived in luxury every single day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, who was covered with sores, and he longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came and licked the rich man, or rich, uh, licked Lazarus' sores. The t there was a time that came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now I'm going to stop here because 
this is a parable. It's not a true story. Now, I know I actually read a pastor who was making a big ordeal about, well, if we get a glimpse into heaven and what it must have looked like, because this is a real story about Lazarus and the rich man. This is just a story, okay? It's a story. It's an illustration. It is probably true that when Jews kind of vision heaven, they envision Abraham's bosom and heaven kind of set up like this. But we have our own visions of what heaven and hell look like too, don't we? And oftentimes they're influenced by like Dante's Inferno and some artwork that maybe you've seen when you're growing up. But just because we have artwork that shows what it might look like does not mean that that's what it looks like. All right, this is just an illustration that's all it is. It's a parable, okay? So in Hades, going on to verse 23, where this man, rich man, was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away, Lazarus by his side. So he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue. I'm in agony because of this fire. Abraham replied, Son, don't you remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things? But now he's comforted here, and you're in agony. Besides this, there's between you and I a great chasm that's set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over to us. So he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. They must be warned, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. But no, Father Abraham. If someone were raised from the dead, they would repent. He said to him, But if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even were someone to raise from the dead. Wow, that's a tough lesson. As I mentioned to you, this is just a parable. But it does point out something really important. There's one point to this story. This purpose of this parable is once again to highlight the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and religious leaders like me. Here's what Jesus' criticism is of the Pharisees. What he is basically saying is those who gain their wealth, their prosperity on the backs of poor people and who surround themselves with great wealth while other people are suffering have no place in God's presence. That's what Jesus' point is. Who is he talking about again? The Pharisees. They were surrounded by poor people who needed to be blessed and fed physically and spiritually, but they were more concerned about their own prosperity. And so they lived in great prosperous homes with great wealth. Again, remember, this Pharisee was wealthy enough that he could feed the disciples of Jesus. He had great wealth while many people suffered and many people starved to death. So again, this probably did not sit well with the Pharisees, this criticism. And Jesus, however, thought that the Pharisees should know better. So now you go over to the second page. The Pharisees, however, are so hardened that Jesus basically is saying that even were somebody to come back from the dead and warn you about what God is trying to tell you, even then, you would still buy into your religious scam so much of this great wealth that you're surrounding yourself with that you would not even listen to somebody who resurrected from the dead. So, let me stop by saying to you this is not an indictment of every Pharisee. This is not a blanket indictment of rich people. We know that Jesus hung around with Pharisees who were good people. In fact, can you name one Pharisee who was a good guy Joseph. that actually, who was? Joseph of Well, okay, but that's a rich guy. But how about a Pharisee? Wasn't he a Pharisee? No. Um, Nicodemus. Joseph was my rich guy. So I said, who was a rich guy? Joseph of Arimathea was a rich guy who hung around with Jesus. And who else was a rich guy who hung around with Jesus? It's kind of ironic that he uses this guy's name to illustrate his point. Lazarus. Now, this is not to be confused with the Lazarus of the parable. That's a different Lazarus because this is just a story. The story of Lazarus who was raised from the dead was a very wealthy person. Okay? So Jesus hung around with Pharisees. Jesus hung around with great wealthy people. But the parable was directed at a very specific group of Pharisees who were using their wealth and making their wealth on the backs of poor people but gave nothing of value in return 
accept more obligation to them. Okay, this is a tough lesson, and I'm going to try to turn something positive about this, because right now, um, it's kind of a little bit depressing, isn't it? But I want to give you something positive. For every negative, there's actually a positive. So let's take a look at what we can learn today that I think God wants us to know from this. The very first bullet point under what we learned, religious leaders, Corey, like you, you're a religious leader now. Did you know that? No. Oh, you are? Kind of. So you're indicted here. Isn't that nice? Well, all right. So religious leaders, anybody who puts themselves up in front of a congregation, anybody who considers themselves the leader of people in the name of God, are to use their blessing to bless their community. Now this kind of ties in, if you remember what we looked at last, or a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus has an overriding passion for people who are not a part of the kingdom of heaven right now. Those sheep who are lost. So we as a church need to be primarily concerned about people outside of our doors. And we're going to do that today in our prayer walk. This is really cool. When we are walking around, one of the cool things that happens, we've done this for many, many, many years, we will have people who start to follow us who don't know who in the world we are and say, what are you guys doing? Well, we're praying for you. We're praying for the community. We need to let this community know that we are here for them. We also need to take the offerings that we make. You guys put it here. You folks need to be convinced that it's being used in a manner that is faithful and is a blessing. Let me tell you something that happened just yesterday in your council that you're not aware of. I'm telling you this because I'm really proud of our congregation. We took $500. We could use $500 to pay bills in this church, okay? But we took $500, our council did, and said that there's a family that really needs some help right now. They don't have food to put on the table. They can't even fix their furnace. There's a woman who's she's struggling with cancer, and uh, her husband is struggling with cancer, and we're really concerned about them. We don't know them. They don't go to church here, but guess what we're doing? We're giving them $500 to pay for groceries that will help get them through this next month. Why? Because that's what churches are supposed to do with the money that you put in the offering plate and what people give. We buy Giant Eagle gift certificates. You're probably not aware of this. I give Giant Eagle gift certificates out to people who are in need. That's with the money that you put in the offering plates. Okay? We have a food basket over there. We hope that when you go out and buy some groceries, that you buy some groceries. You bring them and put them over there. Why? Because that's what we are supposed to do as a church, to bless other people with the resources God has given us. Because not only look at the second bullet point, for the job of us as the church, as leaders of the church and also as lay people, is that we are to bring God to the spiritually hungry and to feed those who are physically hungry as well. I'll tell you a story. My wife's home congregation, love my wife's home congregation, by the way, we're married there, it's a great place. But about 20 years ago, the pastor they had there decided what they were going to do is they are going to do a feeding program for people who are poor. They decided that what they were going to do is they were going to insist that when the poor people came to the church, they had to first of all listen to the pastor preach a sermon. And then they would feed them. And I actually took the pastor aside and I said, that is really stupid. He said, why? We want them to hear the message of Jesus. I said, I want them to hear the message of Jesus too. But how are they going to hear the message of Jesus if they're hungry? Did you ever notice that one of the things that Jesus does before he starts preaching to people is he heals them. He feeds them. He takes care of their physical yearnings and needs before he starts telling them about the love of God. Because people will not hear what you have to say about God if they're physically hurting and hungry and needy. So we have to do both, though. At the same time, we can't just feed them. There's an old phrase, kind of true, that if you want to hear about Jesus, you go to the Baptists. If you want to get food on the table, you go to Lutherans. Well, we're Lutheran Christians. There's kind of a truth to that. Because sometimes we Lutherans and we more liberal denominations are more concerned about feeding the bodies, but we also don't name the name of Jesus. We've got to do both. We've got to feed their bodies, take care of them physically, and we have to feed them spiritually. I'm going to tell you one more true story 
that really annoys me. In our Lutheran church, again, for those who are watching online, you need to understand our background as a church, we are Lutheran Christians. I really get frustrated with my denomination sometimes, as I think we all do. It doesn't matter what denomination you're part of. I'm sure there are things that frustrate you. But our denomination, our bishops, we have 65 bishops in our Lutheran church. Actually, 66 if you can consider the presiding bishop, Bishop Eaton. Which, by the way, Bishop Eaton is fantastic. Our bishop in our synod, Bishop Kucherik, is also fantastic. We are so blessed with two fantastic bishops. However, all the bishops got together one day and were talking about how we do evangelism. Okay? And as they sat there and were discussing about evangelism, many of these very, very liberal bishops said, well, we don't ever have to name the name of Jesus. All you have to do is go out, are you ready for the catchphrase here, and do social justice, and that's like naming the name of Jesus. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, it means we have to work for the poor. By working for the poor and feeding the poor, you've done evangelism. And Bishop Eaton actually stood up and said, well, excuse me, we are the ELCA, we are not the Democratic Party in prayer. That kind of affected, offended a lot of people. She said, we are called as Christians to name the name of Jesus. Yes, we should work justice. Yes, we should feed the poor. But evangelism is also naming the name of Jesus because we are doing it in the name of Jesus. Otherwise, we're just like every other social organization, and who cares? Okay? So I think this is the thing that we need to learn from our lesson for today, that we are called to feed people physically, but also to name the name of Jesus and feed them spiritually because God wants to bring his healing into their lives. So for us Christians, our wealth, our opportunity, the blessing that God has given you today is basically a tool that is given by God to you so that we can bless others. So I hope I turned that into a little more positive lesson. It was kind of a tough lesson to hear. But this is what God has called us to do. God has called us to be a blessing with the resources we've been given. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we ask you to help us to be a blessing with the resources we've been given. We've been richly blessed. We have been entrusted with the financial resources and our offering plate from people in our congregation. We're grateful for that. But God, it's meant to be used to be a blessing to other people. Yes, we have expenses, we have buildings, and I'm very blessed the congregation does help me so that I don't have to work another job so I can be a blessing to other people. But we want to make sure that all the resources that we bring here at this congregation are faithfully used in a way that brings Jesus and brings an ending to physical suffering and brings the name of Jesus into people's lives. And so we pray that you would help us be faithful in the use of these resources to be a blessing to this community of East Pittsburgh and to uh, communities around the world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to end with a uh, song today. And the reason why we're doing this song is because it's one of the songs that we're going to sing in our prayer walk. And I love this song. And it's called You. It's just a reminder again that God wants to come and bless all the nations of the world with his presence and his love. And you are part of that blessing. Mm -hmm.